So, um, uh, I'll be referring to this picture a little later in the talk. I just didn't want to spend the time drawing it in real time. So, at some point towards the end of the talk, we'll understand how that uh, how that picture is calculated is doing a one loop calculation in either the sitter or anti the sitter space. Uh, um, but uh, of course, uh, at this uh, at this uh, workshop, there um, and not just at this workshop, everywhere there's lots and lots of discussions of the idea of emergent space, emergent space time. Um, I believed myself for a very long time that that ultimately uh, it's not it's not that space time emerges from a uh, quantum mechanical system, but that space time and quantum mechanics both have to emerge tied together, inevitably tied together, uh, hand in hand, uh, from some other uh, some other structure, um, and that uh, if that's the case, we should be able to see some mirror of that, some avatar of that phenomenon already in good old-fashioned uh, quantum field theory um, by learning or seeing if it's possible to calculate the observables, uh, uh, which we normally compute by assuming that there's unitary evolution in, in a Hilbert space uh, uh, with, a local, uh, uh, with a local Hamiltonian, um, if there's some way of reproducing all of the observables of a quantum field theory without putting in the space-time, without putting in the Hilbert space structure. And that's something that some number of us have been pursuing for many years now uh, in the simplest first context in which we can uh, start playing with it, uh, which is in the context of scattering amplitude. So, um, and we've seen very concretely in a, it's a toy model. The toy model is uh, planar n equals four super yang mills. See, those of us who work in this business always apologize for this toy model. It is a toy model. The world is not n equals four super yang mills. But it's worth remembering that of all the various toy models we talked about as theoretical physicists that describe the real world, this is the one which is closest to the real world than any of the other ones for the relevant application. Right? You know, so this is a, the, for the application of scattering amplitudes, this theory is identical to the theory that we care about at the LHC at tree level. And beyond that, at loop level, the most complicated part of the loop diagrams is the same in, this, uh, in, in, the, in the toy theory than in the other one. Anyway, just saying that, and I will go back to apologizing for it, uh, but um, uh, because we're physicists after all, but we don't ultimately care about toys. Um, but, um, uh, but still, at least in that context, we can see very concretely, very precisely, what this idea of emergent space-time and, and quantum mechanics can look like. Of course, here it's not the, uh, uh, in, in a very, in a very, spe in a very specific sense, um, uh, we've seen the emergence of new mathematical structures, uh, uh, new mathematical questions that the amplitudes are the answer to, um, and um, uh, at least the direction that that uh, uh, I've been exploring with many of my friends uh, for, for for these years um, uh, is is revealing uh, some structures in uh, in the uh, uh, in the combinatorial algebraic geometry of the Grassmannian uh, and the amplitahedron, uh, which the answer to the question, what is the volume of that object, uh, turns out to have all the properties that we normally ascribe to to the physics being uh, both local and unitary. And you can see there's you can't make it just local and not unitary, or just unitary and not local. They're sort of they're inevitably uh, tied together. So now, what, what, uh, something that uh, allowed a, a lot of progress to be made uh, along these lines is that um, uh, we can see what the imprint of the local and unitary uh, structure of the, of the theory is, practically speaking, on the amplitudes themselves. And locality and unitarity are reflected in very beautiful, simple, analytic properties of the scattering amplitude. So uh, the singularities of the amplitudes tell us something. Uh, the correct kinds of singularities tell us something about the uh, tell us something about these two principles. And once you start staring at it long enough, um, uh, uh, you can start wondering whether there's some other structure that can generate exactly the same singularities without. Uh, you know, you have a pull when some particle goes on shell. That means practically, in the actual expression, there's a one over p squared. 
And in your mind, you might think the only way you could possibly get that 1 over p squared is if there are two gluons, they hit each other, and one propagated over a very long distance to make something happen on the other side. But if you eventually discover other structures that generate exactly the same thing, uh, you can start reading it backwards and, 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 and see how it is that these, uh, these, these other ideas generate the things which we then read backwards, interpret as propagation through space. Not just space. This is space-time. Okay? It's, uh, it's honestly space-time over very, very, uh, uh, but exactly the, uh, the singularities and the factorizations and so on. So, so we're at a good advantage that we knew ahead of time, at least roughly speaking, what those singularities could look like, A. So, uh, and then that means that staring at it long enough, there's B, the second step to try to find another object that intrinsically captures uh, that. And uh, I think if there's one general lesson, there's still a huge amount about this uh, business we don't, we don't understand. It's far from obvious that even this limited case of even the limited problem we care about, uh, that we're still thinking about it in the best way. But I think there's one interesting general lesson, which is that what these objects look like don't live in space-time. And if you have n particles, they live in a higher and higher dimensional space as n gets uh, larger and larger. Really fundamentally, they live in some infinite dimensional space. And if you want to focus on a finite number of particles, well, you have to go to a finite dimensional part of this big infinite dimensional space. So if you have n particles, the, the object lives in a high dimensional space. And what the object does is encode combinatorially all the relationships that, uh, that, uh, that the scattering between these objects induces. Okay? Um, and uh, the usual space-time description is a way of fitting these chain of relationships in our head <laughs> to think that, no, these n particles live in one space and they interact with each other in a local and, uh, and uh, unitary way. Um, but I think, uh, at least along these lines, I, I suspect we're going to keep finding these structures that don't, where we don't think about a bunch of particles living in one space, but we have one object living in a huge dimensional space. Okay. Yes? 